All right. Wednesday, September 20th. Hokies have lost two in a row. And if you think we're going to come on here and be a bunch of sour grapes, negativity, you can go ahead and turn the podcast off because we have flipped the page to the Marshall Thundering Herd. They got a good running back. We're going on the road, but we're going to tell you how we're going to beat them, how we're going to get after them, and talk a little bit about the history of this matchup. And we are joined this week for the first time on the podcast by Coach Mike Holmes. Coach Holmes is doing the Hokies football focus articles. If you haven't seen them yet, they're on the website. Great, great walkthrough on film of what's going on, uh, alignment, assignment, what's going well, what's not going well, what needs to improve. So, Mike, welcome to the podcast. How you doing, my friend? Give the people a little heads up of who you are, where you are, what's your deal? Hey, thanks, Billy and Pat. Great to be here. Um, I'm in Castle Rock, Colorado. Uh, it is a uh, it's a pleasure uh, to join you guys. Uh, like uh, like Billy said, I was a football coach for a very long time uh, at the high school level, uh, head coach for multiple seasons. Uh, so I do have a even though I didn't get to I, I wasn't big enough or fast enough or anything else to play at the college level. Uh, I do have a little bit of uh, knowledge when it comes to again, like you said, alignment and scheme and and things like that. And I try to make uh, make the losses and the wins <laughs> you know, a little bit more palatable um, for, for folks um, if they want to go back and see, hey, what's really going on here. Uh, and uh, you know, unfortunately, we've had a lot to, to diagnose here in the past few weeks. That's right. And Pat Finn, as we always do, let us know how you're doing and let's dive into a uh, dive into a hokey haiku here. Well, thank you. I'm I'm doing great. Appreciate the ask. Uh, I am wearing my Marshall green shirt. You know, we're prepping Marshall. No, actually, I would be wearing. Uh, this is my rowback plug for everyone who's watching right now. Um, coincidentally, wearing green, but uh, I would like to wear this. It's still drying. Took it out of the washer not too long ago. The rowback Commonwealth polo white effect is coming up at the end of the month against Pittsburgh. Go to Roback.com, find the Commonwealth. I know there's still some left on there. Use Suns VT, 20% off your order. Pull it up on YouTube if you're listening. It's 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 great, Billy. Well, also, don't there? think that they're still sticking around because people aren't buying them. We were adamant with our connection over at Roback. We said, hey, look, we sold you out last year. Do not cap our ability to have a successful promotion by not ordering enough polos. So they made sure they stocked up. Wide effect against Pittsburgh. We're playing at night. Night effect. It's the night, it's the whiteout re uh what's the word I'm looking for? We're trying to set the record straight on night games where we wear white. Um, because the record is very much unstraight on uh on that. So we're trying to trying to get that right. But Pat, hokey haiku time. We are actually going to recycle these because they were submitted last week or uh, after the Rutgers game. We did not get to read them, but I figured we can put Grant Watson and Patrick Bowers in the spotlight here on our Marshall preview. Tailgate, this is from Grant Watson. Tailgate was a blast. The third quarter was awesome. Can we beat Marshall? We're going to find out tonight if we can beat Marshall. Patrick Bowers, fans incredible. What's up with all the train sounds? A new low we've reached. I got to tell you, these train on our YouTube video for the Rutgers post game, all the train references were pretty funny. Um, there has been the conversation about the train has has dripped into the Marshall preview. So uh, we are still talking about the train, but we can't be talking about the train uh, because. I don't know if they have that many trains in Huntington, West Virginia. You know, it's a very hilly area of the country. So we're going to talk about Hokie history and the long line of history that these two football programs have. Uh, if you look at the Marshall and Virginia Tech Venn diagram, there certainly is some overlap. And that begins right now in the current state of Virginia Tech football with Brent Pry. Brent Pry's dad, Jim played quarterback at Marshall. Uh, Jim was a junior reserve quarterback in 1971 for Marshall. Um, as you guys know, the uh, the Marshall 
plane crash tragedy tragedy was on November 14th, 1970. Um, Virginia Tech definitely had some had some connections there. Um, Coach Pry's dad, Jim, had some former teammates that were on that plane. Um, Frank Loria, a Virginia Tech former All-American from Clarksburg, West Virginia. He was on that plane. And also uh, the head coach of Marshall, uh, Rick, I believe Rick Tolley, uh, was also on that plane, who was a Virginia Tech graduate as well. So a lot of uh, a lot of connections here with that 1970 team. Frank Loria, if you guys haven't read up on Frank Loria or Frankie, as Coach Beamer likes to call him, I actually dug into my one of my favorite books, one of my favorite pieces of literature, and uh, cracked it open. Let me be frank, Coach Beamer's book, and uh, pulled a few quotes on Frank Loria, uh, but he did play free safety with Coach Beamer in the late 1960s. He was Tech's very first consensus All-American, was also the first player in school history to be named an All-American for two straight years. Frank Loria Jr. has a quote uh, where he says, I was told that Frank Beamer was asked if Frank Loria were still alive today. Did he think my dad would be working for him? And Coach Beamer said that he thought he would be working for my dad. So that, that's a testament to, to the kind of guy that Frank Loria was, uh, a very well-liked guy, a very talented football player. And um, if you haven't read uh, that chapter in Frank's book, you should. Uh, I know before Virginia Tech played at Marshall in 2011, uh, the Tech team brought a hokey stone that inscribed to honor both Frank Loria and Rick Tolley. Um, and then Frank Loria Jr. did the coin flip. Coach Beamer had referenced it as one of the more emotional days in his coaching career. And, um, you know, even just on the heels of this Rutgers game, the connections that we have with um, with the Marshall football program, also realizing that, you know, the first game we played uh, after 9-11 was at Rutgers. It was Rutgers' home opener, certainly an emotional day, and also an emotional day was the first game after the Virginia Tech tragedy in 2007 as well. Um, so uh, just just speaking to the uh, the connections of, of these two football programs, definitely a lot of respect between the two programs. Uh, as far as more connections go, Xavion Turner Bradshaw's dad, Ahmad Bradshaw, who we know, Super Bowl champion with the New York Giants. New York Giants legend legend played for the thundering herd randy moss love randy moss chad pennington major throwback byron leftwich who was on the uh the team in 2002 when uh, we played them i believe it was in blacksburg played with uh, a broken leg carried across the field on a broken leg yep uh cj mccray i almost said zach mccray that's also a throwback uh, played at Marshall prior to Virginia Tech. J.C. Price coached at Marshall prior to Virginia Tech. Grant Wells, this is the Grant Wells Super Bowl, uh, who played at Marshall before Virginia Tech. And then who went from Virginia Tech to Marshall? C.J. Rivas and Tavante Beckett, who is now with the Houston Roughnecks. And then just the walk down memory lane, just a few notable contests that we can talk about before we talk about this year's storylines. Our first game against Marshall was in 1914, and we've played them 14 or 13 total times. This is the 14th matchup. We've had over 100 years since our first Marshall game. So, um, again, the uh, the Appalachian battle here. The first uh, This will be the first matchup since our 2018 makeup game. If you guys remember the Hurricane Florence cancellation with East Carolina and all of the turmoil that was uh, just populating Twitter uh, those few weeks was honestly wild. In that 2018 game that was after the UVA game scheduled to essentially give us a win to become bowl eligible, Ryan Willis balled out. He had four touchdowns in the first half. He had 312 total yards. And then you read the notes, Taiwan Garbutt recovered a fumble on the first play from scrimmage. And you're like, wow, Garbutt was in the program for a long time. You got the 2013 game 
which was my second game in Lane Stadium as a student. And it was, I believe it was also a white effect. But that game was actually a poncho effect because it was absolutely pouring rain the entirety of the game. There was rain. There was camouflage helmets. There was a missed Ethan Kaiserling field goal at the end of the game. There was overtime. And then the paper boy, Willie Byrne, with the delivery, saving us on the tipped pass from Logan Thomas for the touchdown. Go back to 2011 in Huntington. I remember watching this game on like the CBS uh, CBS network, like, you know, but had like bootleg it. And um, orange helmets, orange pants, had a big game from David Wilson. Uh, but, you know, we, it, it, this was one of those games where Tech did not look good early, pulled away late, 130 to 10. 2009. This game was the Ryan Williams and David William or David Wilson highlight tape. We had 605 yards of total offense, 444 total rushing yards, and Ryan Williams and David Wilson ran for 165 and 164 yards respectively. And then the last game we'll talk about today, 2002, a ranked matchup between the number nine Hokies and the number 17 Thundering Herd. You had KJ and Lee Suggs balling out that game. They combined for five touchdowns on the ground. We contained Byron Leftwich and actually got out to a 33 to nothing lead. Leftwich had three fourth quarter touchdowns, but uh, we won the game 41 to 17. So that's Hokie history. That's in the past. We got to talk about the present. Let's talk about some storylines, BRM. I'm so glad that honestly this game is on the schedule and this game is being played in Huntington because a lot of people like to get upset. And one of the biggest things that we've been upset about all off season is you have to listen to everybody say, man, none of these teams go out and play smaller schools on the road. Why is Virginia tech the only team that plays at Marshall? Why are we the only team that plays at old dominion? Well, I'm here to tell you, we're not the only team that does that. So I, you know, quick Google search, because I'm like, you know, maybe, maybe the masses are right. Maybe the rioting and the freaking out is all completely rational. Maybe we truly are the only team that does that. Well, 17 Power 5 programs traveled to Group of 5 programs this year alone, alone. Alabama went to USF. Ole Miss went to Tulane. Vandy went to UNLV. Texas Tech lost. At Wyoming, Boston College at Army, Miami at Temple, NC State at UConn. NC State is going to Stores, Connecticut. I can't imagine that travel. I can't imagine that crowd. And then Oklahoma. Oklahoma is going to Tulsa. So it's not hard. It requires minimum research. It is very easy for you to drive a narrative that Whip Babcock is an evil, bad human being who hates football and hates all of us and wants us to lose games at Power 5, Group of 5, crossover games. It's just simply not true. It's simply not true. Other teams do it. It's an opportunity to go look at the beauty that is West Virginia. Well, I have a few thoughts on that. First of all, uh, this is just me. You saying Texas Tech lost this week. I'm just bringing up the fact that Oklahoma State got absolutely blown out by South Alabama. I know that was at <laughs> Oklahoma State, which makes it even crazier. But I'm just acknowledging the fact that that happened. Um, two... This is a return trip from the 2018 game where Marshall did us a huge favor by scheduling this game on a whim, coming to Blacksburg in front of, you know, a 30,000 uh, person crowd and helping us get bowl eligible. Now, as far as getting an understanding of, okay, yeah, you got Bama going to USF, you have SEC teams, you have Pac-12 teams, you have Big 12 teams you know, uh, leaving and going to G5. I did see David Hale present some more data on the subject today where Tech, Duke, Miami are all on the road versus non-Power 5 teams this week. And he said, here are the true road games versus non-Power 5 in the playoff era. The ACC has played a substantial amount of, 
more games against G5, non-P5 on the road in the playoff era. They have played 67 of these games. The Big 12 has played 27. The Big 10 has played 26. The Pac-12, 41. And the SEC, only 25. So, admittedly, everyone's doing it now. But the reason that this may be a narrative is because the ACC does it a lot more, twice as much, 2x more than the other conferences. I will say the ACC likely may have more rivalries that uh, are traditional that have the G5 and P5 overlap. For example, Appalachian State and East Carolina play teams from inside of North Carolina all the time. Um, So that's just me presenting more data. Uh, But it did seem different this year to see a team like Alabama go to USF. Yeah, if I can tag on to that, Pat, um, there is a reason a lot of these teams are doing that, too. You know, back in the day where they had, you know, I I graduated in 2003, so this is a long time ago. But you used to have to pay for play games. Teams would, you know, Virginia Tech would say, hey, let's go get JMU. Bad example. But they would have those teams come in and they would pay them a substantial amount of money to come in and get whipped for four quarters. And uh, now with more parity in college football, more teams that used to be doormats stepping up and becoming those FBS level teams, even though they are group of five, it does provide an opportunity for some of these power five teams and these coaches to say, hey, let's work on getting our, our players and our teams up for that competition where we know that we're going to steamroll, make sure that we come out strong, make sure that we know how to go through all the processes and come on come out in the second half ready to go, even when we're up 30 points. So, and, you know, even in a lot of the cases, unfortunately for Tech, you know, we, we, we struggled in some of those games. But if you're in Alabama going to South Florida, one, you're getting, to, you're getting those kids into a pro stadium. They, I mean, they were playing at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. So that's an experience in and of itself. But also, you're, you know, you're, there's a statement is saying, hey, all of these Florida kids that we want to recruit, they can come see us. You know, they, they, there is a method to to the madness of some of those games. Let's dive into some of these lines for the football game. So currently, I mean, coming oh, wait, off wait, wait, let's back up. I know, I know, uh, I know. Mike has a few talking points on uh, on the storylines too. Oh, Mike, you're hiding your hokey history, dude. You <laughs> get some more. <laughs> hey, so everybody remembers, you know, Charles Huff is Marshall's coach. Uh, he was actually, if you ask folks on uh, on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it, uh, he was one of the uh, hot targets right before we hired Brent Pry. Uh, you know, he was he was one of those guys that um, has the pedigree. Came from Alabama. He was also at Penn State. Um, he had a little bit of the pedigree, and a lot of a lot of Hokie fans uh, wanted us to go after Huff. But uh, he was at Penn State with Brent Pry from 14 to 17. Uh, he was at Vandy with Coach Pry at 11. Um, you know, Marshall is coming off of a, they're coming off a bye week. So that's good or bad. I always like to have, you know, my, my teams, I, I, I never really liked bye weeks. You develop bad habits during bye weeks. You can at some time, at some time, you know, it does allow you to get healthy. If you're banged up, I kind of wish we had a bye week now for the Hokies. Uh, but Marshall is coming off beating Albany, uh, at home. And then, la- and then two weeks ago, they went to East Carolina, uh, and that was a pretty tight game, relatively close game. Um, Hokies are a little banged up now, uh, so we'll see how how that uh, that works. Um, Virginia Tech and Marshall are very similar on both sides of the football. Um, as Ed mentioned in the last pod uh, that I listened to, he he ran down the inexperience that Virginia Tech had versus the experience that Rutgers had, and that was a uh, and that was a drastic difference. Um, I, I think that might end up playing a role in this game as well, as Marshall does have a uh, an older roster uh, than Virginia Tech does. And then a, a little fun fact, um, you mentioned Chad Pennington earlier, uh, Pat being a Marshall alum. His kid, and that makes me feel really old, his kid is, uh, is a redshirt freshman on Marshall's roster right now. Chad Pennington, my brother had a poster of Chad Pennington in his room because he loved the color green. 
Uh, we were Giants fans, but he uh, nice. he had a Chad Pennington poster next to his Incredible Hulk poster in his uh, in his bedroom. So uh, nice. not sure how that relates, but. <laughs> and he's a quarterback. He doesn't have the uh, the golden red locks, though. It looks like he's got the uh, the darker hair. <laughs> moving uh, moving along to the lines here. So everybody, look, the line comes out. Hokies were at first seven point dogs to Marshall, which is, I mean, there's no other word for it. It's a it's a jarring uh, number to read on a piece of paper. Um, but that line has since moved down to Virginia Tech is getting five points and the over under sits at a astronomical 41 points. Um, that is a combination. I know we're going to get into it on look, Marshall, they like to run the football. They have a really good defense, Virginia Tech. Not really sure what we love to do yet. Um, but we haven't scored a lot of points up until this point yet. So. And again, this football game is on at noon, September 23rd on Saturday on ESPN2 at Joan C. Edwards Stadium. So shout out to all of you making the trip out to Huntington. I will not, Pat will not, Mike will not be making that trip. Um, so, Mike, talk to me about the Thunder and Herds offense. All right, so just like uh, Virginia Tech, um, Marshall runs a multiple spread look, uh, which means most of their snaps will be out of the shotgun. Uh, they will run three and four wide combinations every once in a while. They will uh, they will bring some tight ends into the game, uh, some H-backs into the game, and kind of motion some folks around. Um, the uh, offensive line is very, very questionable in pass protection. Um, is They are much better uh, running the football. Uh, their O-line is undersized. I think they average under 300 pounds, which is uh, which could be a benefit uh, for us. Um, and Charles Huff is a run-first guy. Uh, he's gonna he's he was a running backs coach at Alabama. He's gonna want to take advantage of mismatches. Uh, they use some misdirection, pulling linemen. I know Billy likes that. Were you ever a, you were a puller, weren't you? You like to get out there and run? I was. Yeah, yeah. I like to <laughs> run around. I like to consider myself. Look, it was me. Um, of course, Wyatt, better football player than I was, but we were always in the front uh, anytime we did conditioning. So I was a little bit of a little bit of a speedster, if I may say. So I mean, you guys, you guys have seen Billy, the cheetah in khakis video after <laughs> the Pittsburgh 2017 game. So the guy was running; he was moving. I will right, say well, uh, Mike, one one thing, not to step on you at all. The the offensive line as a whole is undersized, but. I don't want anyone else to tune on the game and be like, this guy, Mike, told me they were small, and they look at Dalton Tucker, who's number 68. This guy is a mountain of a human being. He's the only massive guy, but he is six foot seven, 317 pounds from Paris, Kentucky. But the rest of the offensive line is, uh, is not that large. And, and just on the offensive line really quickly, Mike, um, from left to right, redshirt senior, junior transfer, Junior transfer, redshirt junior, redshirt senior. So very, very experienced group up front. Yeah, yeah. A lot of age, a lot of experience up there. Um, they have a pretty decent punter. I would uh, also imagine that if we get into that situation where if it is a short yardage situation, fourth and two, fourth and three, Huff is probably going to want to punt and play field position, uh, very much like Greg Schiano did last week, um, you know, and, and, and try to rely on his defense, especially seeing what our – Offense has been able to do the past few weeks. Um, some notable players uh, on the Marshall side. Their quarterback is a guy named Cam Fancher, um, 6'1", 201, redshirt sophomore. Um, he will run. He can run and will run. Um, if you go back and if you watch some film, I don't know if you if anybody wants to go back and watch them play University of Albany. Uh, but uh, if there was a lane that opened up, he took off. Um, and he'd uh, get downfield, slide, pop up in a hurry. Uh, he's a lefty. Um, that, uh, that adds all kinds of different things. Uh, most offensive coordinators are right-handed by nature, which means they always want to uh, try to run things to the right side, and it's difficult to kind of get that balance. Sorry, I had to do my Frank Beamer hands there. <laughs> um, but if, they, but if, we can, if he gets time, uh, he can literally make every single throw on the field. Um, and that's what it looked like, uh, looked like watching him on film. Um, their most dangerous players are running back, uh, Rasheen Ali, six foot 209 junior, uh, literally could take it to the house on every snap. Um, he, if, if he gets the ball and there's some space, 
Uh, it's going to be – he can take it to the house. If if we do anything on defense, we have to, have to, have to contain uh, Ali. Um, and then uh, every once in a while, they'll rotate in uh, number 28, Ethan Payne, a running back, and he's the more north-south guy. He's the guy that's going to attack the A-gaps, get north-south, uh, and try to run that thing uh, up the middle. Um, and they kind of alternate series every once in a while. They do have a couple wide receivers in Montgomery and uh, number one, Talik Keaton. They'll run them on jet sweeps. Um, not so much of a passing threat for this offense because they, they prefer to run the ball. Um, so they are kind of a one-dimensional offense. But again, if they have time to throw, those receivers can get separation and they can get open. Turning the page over to the defense, and I do want to highlight this as well. Um, I, I just am very concerned with our ability to get something going on the ground. I, I said this going into the Rutgers game. Rutgers was a well-coached group. They were a large group. They were an experienced group. And like you said, we're dealing with that again. So you can go from the left defensive end all the way to the right. Uh, redshirt junior, redshirt uh, junior transfer, redshirt junior redshirt senior um so again a really really experienced group um well coached group this it's in my keys i'm going to talk about it again when we get there but this game to me really comes down to up front um and i know that it's odd to talk about that when you're playing a group of five school in your virginia tech but this is this is where the game is going to be won or lost up front on offense and on defense so um, Mike, let's, uh, let's talk about the defense a little bit. Yeah. Uh, well to go along uh, with, it kind of goes along with defense too. Um, but you know, we adjusted our run scheme last week, uh, and we had much, much better outcomes, um, as far as yards per carry. Now, granted Chiron drones, he was a part of that. Um, but switching to more of an outside zone scheme, um, where we were attacking off tackle versus, uh, versus trying to run right up the middle. It made the defensive tackles and defensive ends widen out a little bit, which allowed drones to get some of those runs up the middle. Um, I think if we are able to stick with that, and we ran some uh, power toss uh, lead a little bit, um, the key is uh, for our offensive line, it's going to be able to um, make sure that those guys don't pass up work to find work. I know you've probably heard that term before, Billy. Um, but, uh, but they, there are a couple of times where our linemen run up field and they let guys go by and those guys end up making the play, but on defense, um, this is going to be the first time that we play a defense, uh, that runs at even front primarily. Uh, these guys run a four, two, five. It's going to look very similar to what they see in practice when they go up against the Hokies. Um, so, uh, they, they kind of mix and match their looks, but they do run four down linemen most of the time. Um, they are very aggressive. Um, the linebackers will uh, try to see the read, get right upfield, uh, and try to make the play. They do act a little reckless at times. They do overrun and over pursue the ball. Sounds familiar. Um, you know, a lot of our linebackers will do the same thing. Um, but they, uh, they will bring pressure from all sides. They will run twists and stunts with the defensive line. Uh, they will bring, uh, corners on blitzes, they'll bring safeties on blitzes. Uh, and so it's going to make, it's going to be for Chiron drones in his second start, it's going to be something for him to be able to um, be able to pick that up. And I think you'll see Bowen use a lot more motion this week uh, to try to figure out and determine where the pressure is going to come from and kind of give Chiron drones a little bit of a cheat code uh, as far as that is concerned. Defense at Marshall is allowing 15 points per game. Uh, that's 30th in the FBS. However, they also have the 132nd strongest schedule out of 133 teams playing East Carolina and Albany. So you know, Virginia Tech has uh, has been in that ballpark the last two weeks uh, with 17 points against Purdue. And was it 16 last week against Rutgers? So Let's make sure we can uh, we can up that average on the uh, on the Marshall side of the ball here. If we roll into special teams, there's not much to point out here, um, but I do want to make a comment on field goal kicking at Marshall. It's certainly a struggle. You have two guys 
Cameron Lake and Reese Verhoff. Uh, Cameron Lake is one of two uh, f- uh, in the kicking game. Reese Verhoff is 0 for 1 in the kicking game. So these guys are going to rely on their running game when it gets close, um, when, when they're knocking on the door to the red zone. It sounds like they do not want to trot their guys out there to kick field goals here this year. Keys to the game. Billy, is this you or is this Mike who uh, who has the first point? I can. I, Mike has a longer answer than me, so I can just I can just reiterate my point. It, it comes down to the line of scrimmage, and it, it is it is a it is a fearful thing to have to say that it comes down to the line of scrimmage. Um, that that's that's what it is. We have a very old defensive line that quite frankly needs to live up to their, to their experience and live up to the, to their hype in the preseason. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of seniors, a lot of guys who have gotten a lot of snaps. Um, they have a huge, huge challenge ahead of them on Saturday. Rasheen Ali is an amazing running back. Um, and it's going to come down to that. It's basically going to be, this is going to be a slug fest. This is going to be your prototypical, you know, I think this is very similar to tuning in, on big noon kickoff, and you got Iowa playing Penn State. You got uh, Nebraska playing, you know, Illinois. It's going to be one of those type of football games. So uh, it's just featuring an ACC team and I think Sunbelt, wherever Marshall is. Um, but that's what you're looking yeah. at. So, you know, you have to win the line of scrimmage. I, I would argue Virginia Tech has not won the line of scrimmage in any games that they played except for Old Dominion, and that is more a uh, reflection on we were just a ton more talented than they were. Um, so my key to the game is win the line of scrimmage, be aggressive, be big and, um, show us something, show us something. You're going to have the added benefit of what Kyron drones has brought to the running game. Um, and Mike, you did a great job explaining how we've kind of changed up what we do in the run game, finally attacking outside, uh, giving Basial Tootin some more lanes to run in. would love to see some Malachi Thomas is in there as well, but, um, the line of scrimmage is going to be crucially important for this team, uh, come Saturday. You know, and uh, I know we've tried to run it a little bit, um, you know, and but a a screen game that would would be super, super effective against, uh, you know, the the aggressive D lines that we've been playing. You know, a lot of these guys have just been pinning their ears back. But for some reason, I don't know if it's timing or if it's reps or there's a lot of different factors that are going into it. But our running back screen game just hasn't been where it needs to be to kind of limit that pass rush and make those defensive linemen think a little bit before they just pin their ears back and go. But, um, but I agree. The line of scrimmage is going to be absolutely crucial uh, to this game, but the having, being able to limit Ali, as you said, force Cam Fancher to beat us with his arm. I plays into our strengths a little bit. Our, you know, even though we are missing some folks or missing the seer peoples, and I know Stroman's banged up a little bit. I think I saw Andy bitter today posted something at practice where uh, it was uh, most Phillips and Jalen Jones on the back end um, that were playing back there. Um, force Cam Fancher to beat us with his arm. Make those make those smaller receivers uh, work to get separation, work to get open. Uh, that real, I think that really helps us out a little bit. Um, most important thing, got to hold on to the football. Um, I understand, you know, that we the drones had the fumble last week. And uh, we had the interception, which I think personally was, if you read my article on sonsofsaturday.com, uh, there was a there was a misrun route. You had two receivers in the exact same spot, and that was the reason why uh, that play failed. Um, but hold on to the football, limit turnovers, chew the clock, make the clock your best friend, um, stay out there, keep your defense as fresh as possible, you know, five, six, seven minute drives if you can. Um, and uh, that's the the last note I have on here is maximize our minutes on the field with the new rules in college football where you where the clock doesn't stop for first downs and when you go out of bounds, you have limited possessions. I think the the latest thing that I saw was it's a possession a half per team uh, that you're losing. So those those days where uh, you would have, a scripted series just to kind of see what the defense is going to line up at or the offense is going to line up at and just play base and go from there. Those days are gone. You got, you have to come out hot. You have to come out on fire and you, and you can't afford to go three and out because you're not going to get that. So you're not going to get those series back. Um, 
So yeah, I think it's super important that we come out and start hot, whether it's on offense or defense, um, maybe start mixing up some stuff um, on the, with the defensive line, uh, kind of create some havoc, create some chaos, cloud some stuff up in the middle, um, you know, cause a jumble, make, uh, make Ali bounce different places and, and uh, you know, just try, try to do what we can to kind of mix some things up a little bit. Score yeah. predictions. Score predictions. Mike, we'll let you go. You got a, you got some nice headwind here. What do you got? All right. Uh, so I think it's going to be a close game all throughout. Um, we're going to, I think it's going to be a little bit back and forth. And I think we're going to, uh, we're going to drive down to the end of the game, score a touchdown, uh, win the game 27, 24 Hokies, 27, 24. If you asked me for my score prediction following the Rutgers game, it would have been different than this. And it's still September. We haven't flipped the calendar yet. And I can't go against the Hokies playing against Marshall. I think this is going to be a hideous ball game. I think you're going to have to strap in. I think you're going to have to accept that it's, you know, you're going to have a little bit of a tummy ache to kick off your Saturday. There's a great slate, by the way, on Saturday. There are so many great football games. Um, if there was ever a perfect game to have our game over at noon or at 3.30, this is the this is the correct week for that to happen. Um, so I'm going to go with 17 to 20 Virginia Tech. Um, that's it. I wish I had more for you. I'm going to go with Virginia Tech 17 to 20. <laughs> I think uh, I think there's not going to be a whole lot of scoring going on. I think you're going to see a ton of field position management. Another thing that's going to be really important in this football game is, and I know this is a very like high level thing to say, it's going to be a very important coaching game. When you're having less possessions, when you're playing the field goal, the field position game, um, coaching, time management are going to be so 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 important. Um, and I think that's going to be overwhelmingly crucial. So. Um, this wasn't mentioned also in the Marshall offense and wasn't mentioned in the keys, but I'm really curious to see how our linebackers play. Fits have been an issue. Assignment has been an issue. Alignment has been an issue. We talked about the motion that just left us completely, completely naked on the, uh, on the far side of the field with no contain. You, if you fall asleep, it's going to be Rashina Lee hitting his face on the, uh, on the field goal, on the field goal post. So, um, I'm going 17 to 20 Virginia Tech under hits and Virginia Tech covers and wins outright. It's funny because last week everyone was describing the Rutgers Tech game as going to be a very ugly football game. And I don't think it was. I thought it was, no. a, no. you know, I, you know, we mounted a comeback. It was a solid football game despite our slow start and despite Rutgers pulling away at the end. But I completely agree with you. This is going to be an ugly one. I have Virginia Tech winning 21 to 20. Got to take advantage of field position. This is where like you need you need a, a solid punt return, a solid kick return. Like Mike was saying earlier, leverage Basial Tutin in the passing game because we saw what he did against uh, Old Dominion. No, against Purdue. The touchdown against Purdue, right? Um, yes. The wheel route. Yep. It, was, it was fantastic. And Tutin should be targeted in the passing game you know malachi and tutin got 15 touches last week in the run game open them up a little bit uh limit drones as carries you know down under 20 let's get tutin and malachi over 20 but uh virginia tech 21 marshall 20 and that brings us into the letters from the lunch pail we only have one letter and it's not a question it's more of a statement Virginia Tech, this is from at Rang29999. Virginia Tech money line, lock it up. This team under Pry has not overachieved once. That changes Saturday as the Hokies are a hard to fathom seven and a half point dog. I know that line was as high as nine points. Now it's down to five, five and a half, but could be some good value. Hokies plus 135, plus 150, 160, whatever. Uh, Whatever your odds maker is giving you, but I, I agree with you, Mr. Rang. This this might be the week for the Hookies money line play. I'm really excited for a couple of things. I'm really excited to watch Kyron Drones uh, jitters aside. I really didn't get the sense, obviously, from the first fumble that he was kind of overwhelmed. Uh, I think he was just dealing with you know what Grant Wells has had to deal with, which is a very 
very one dimensional offense and running around like your life depends on it in the backfield when he drops back. I'm interested to see how he grows in his second game as a Hokie. Um, I guess that's another question. I'm interested to see who the starting quarterback is. I'm interested to see if Kyron Jones plays the entire game. I mean, I know we talked about the depth chart before the depth chart came out and it said Kyron Jones or Grant Wells. I have to imagine that it's going to be Kyron Jones trotting out there this week. Uh, I'm interested to see if Jalen Lane is healthy enough to play. I think that that's something we're all going to be watching and, and hoping that he is. And I'm also interested to see how Virginia Tech handles the safeties this week. Um, if it is Mose Phillips and uh, Jalen Jones or what that looks like. So, you know, a lot of question marks before we get into ACC play here coming up soon. A lot of great football to watch outside of uh, the Virginia Tech game. And please, 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 please. I don't want to come back on the podcast on Monday and talk about how three of our defensive backs were in the top four in tackling. We have to have linebackers and D tackles and defensive ends be disruptors. We have to have more than two tackles for loss in the game. Um, you know, so we know what we're going to be looking for. We don't necessarily know who's going to be on the field, um, but this is a this is a good test for Virginia Tech four games into the season. So um, those are my closing thoughts. Does anybody else have anything we haven't talked about yet? Go out there on the road, get a tough win, bring it home. You got Pittsburgh on the 30th. And then it gets really tough. So you got to take advantage of having a, a game against what should be a lesser opponent here uh, in week four. Yeah. Go, Mike, you got anything? Yeah. Uh, go into the game with positivity that you're going to go move the ball. Um, you know, as you mentioned, Kyle, I, I don't think drones is one of those guys that he's kind of unflappable. He looks, he looks very collected. He never looks like the game, you know, doesn't look like it's too fast for him. Um, it doesn't look, you know, doesn't look like he gets rattled very often. Uh, he owns up to mistakes. You know, he kind of, kind of, you know, has that kind of it factor about him. Um, and 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 it's not that Wells played his way out of the lineup. Um, I think, you know, this was an opportunity when he got hurt that Drones came in. I think he took it took pretty good advantage of it. You know, completed over fifty percent of his passes. Uh, was able uh, able to kind of move the ball a little bit and spread the ball around uh, a little bit more. I think as the game got on, he got better, um, which was which was something really positive. And I think um, you know this is going to be the first full week. I mean, we don't know who's going to roll out there. I mean, they, it is Grant Wells, you know, former school. They may trot him out there in the first series. I I, I don't know, but if this is Drones' second week in a row. He has an opportunity to take the reins uh, and, and of the offense, and I think I think um, if he does that, I think the coaching staff, fan base, other players on the team, I think they can rally around him. I think Grant Wells would rally around him too. We just saw him on the sideline uh, during the broadcast, you know, interacting with them, kind of helping each other out. So I think there's a really good base. Um, so hey, you know, bring your hard hats. Let's go to work. I've enjoyed this uh, this end. I don't think we've ever done like parting words. I feel like I feel like three parents dropping their kids off at college, and you have like one more <laughs> thing to say before before uh, you walk out the door. Not that I have any experience with that, but I do want to say one last thing. Um, so this weekend, um, we are going to be doing a watch party at the Poor Tap Room in West Midtown at the Interlock. Uh, got together with um, I want to shout out Allison Elkins for um, bringing up the idea. David Wilson is going to be joining us as well. He's super excited. So, you know, backflips, um, car bombs, whatever you're into, we will be hanging out there with the Atlanta Hokies. That's the official watch party for that. 10% off food during the game. Um, if I have enough beers, maybe I'll buy everybody shots. That's not a promise. That's just a tendency that, that I do have sometimes. Um, so, but looking forward to it. Should be a bunch of fun. If you're making the trip down to Huntington, um, safe travels. Bring the noise, bring the energy. Shout out to our guy, um, Visionary Dan. I know he's making the trip. I know he spent some time at Marshall too. So shout out to him as well. And uh, let's win a football game. Let's get back in the win column.